Hello, my name is Martin Kaplan and I'm the Professor of uh, Gastroenterology and Neuroendocrine Tumours at the Royal Free Hospital in London. It's a pleasure to welcome you uh, to this uh, short series of lectures giving an overview of updates in neuroendocrine tumour management at the Royal Free Hospital and some recent advances and exciting results that have been published in the field. Neuroendocrine tumours are said to be relatively rare cancers but in fact, in the UK, there's probably 2,000 people diagnosed each year with neuroendocrine tumours. And because they're mainly slower growing types of tumour, there's around about 20,000 people at least living with neuroendocrine tumours in the UK. So these tumours are not quite as rare as people think. They're probably more common than both pancreatic cancer and uh, gastric cancer. Neuroendocrine tumours can be found anywhere um, in the body and they're called neuroendocrine tumours because they can make hormones and cause symptoms such as flushing and uh, diarrhoea. Although many patients will have absolutely no uh, symptoms at all except for perhaps a feeling of discomfort related to tumours in the abdomen or in the liver. When I started the clinic um, at the Royal Free Hospital in 1996 we had 30 patients now, in 2015, we have over 1,500 patients under our care. The aim today is to give you a flavour of the advances in the field, which really are hopefully, hopefully going to affect the management and the quality of life of many of our patients. And now I'd like to hand you over to uh, my colleagues, who are going to give you an update on some of the exciting advances in the field of neuroendocrine tumours, which is affecting our patient management. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Christos Tumpanakis. I'm a consultant in gastroenterology and neuroendocrine tumours at the Neuroendocrine Tumour Unit of Royal Free Hospital London. Today we're going to discuss some new developments with regards to the management of carcinoid syndrome. Carcinoid syndrome, as you know, is a group of symptoms which is noted in advanced small bowel nets, bronchial nets and ovarian nets, and consists of flushing, chronic diarrhea, bronchospasm and carcinoid heart disease. Serotonin is a hormone that plays a key role in the development of this syndrome as it is produced by the neuroendocrine cells and is not yet inactivated by the liver. At present, in the last few years, we've been using monthly injections such as octreotide LAR and lariotide autogel for the management of this syndrome. However, Sometimes patients develop breakthrough symptoms despite the highest dose of those injections. In those situations, we have some options which are rather inconvenient, not tolerated, quite interventional or not widely available. Therefore, we needed something new. And this new came over the last few years as a part of clinical trials. The Lotrisat Etiprate is a new oral agent that inactivates an enzyme that is mandatory for the production of serotonin by the tumor cells. The results of phase two trials were encouraging and recently, end of September, in the European Society of Medical Oncology Conference, the results of a phase three trial called Telestar were announced. Patients had received either placebo or this new medication in a small dose the medication in a larger dose, and the results were quite encouraging. Up to 30% of patients had seen decrease in the bowel movements in week 12, and this medication was quite well tolerated with mild nausea and depression seen in approximately 15-20% to 20 of patients. In conclusion, the Lotusat Etiprate is a promising new agent for management of carcinoid syndrome as it can decrease substantially bowel movements of those patients. It's quite safe with only mild side effects and in combination with long-acting somatostatin analogs could be a good and long-standing treatment option for patients with carcinoid syndrome. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, my name is Dr. Shonak Navalkisur. I'm a consultant in nuclear medicine at the Royal Free Hospital 
and today I'm going to speak on the recent advances and developments in targeted radionuclide therapy for neuroendocrine tumors. The most commonly used radionuclide therapy for neuroendocrine tumors are peptide receptor radionuclide therapies, which is often referred to as PRRT. PRRT is a radionuclide therapy that targets the somatostatin receptor. These receptors are overexpressed on the surface of a large proportion of well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor cells. The two most popular radionuclides used for PRRT are yttrium-90 and lutetium-177, which are bound to octatate or a similar somatostatin analog. The popularity of lutetium dotatate has increased over the last few years due to its high efficacy and low levels of toxicity. However, PRRT has been criticized by the medical community at large in that there is no robust evidence to support its use. The largest studies performed by the Rotterdam Group have shown that lutetium dotatate improves survival compared to historical controls over a variety of primary tumor sites. By historical controls, I mean they looked at patients where outcomes before PRRT was available and after there was a therapeutic option. There have also been observational studies and the two largest groups that have looked at this are the Rotterdam and Milan group that have showed significant benefit from this treatment with time to progression approximately three years from initiating this treatment. However, historical data and observational studies are prone to selection bias. We finally have published randomized control data for lutetium dotatate, the NETO-1 study. The NETO-1 trial includes patients who had metastatic or locally advanced, inoperable, histologically proven mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors who had previously been on 20 to 30 milligrams of octatide LAR and had progressive disease. Over 200 patients were randomized to either four cycles of lutetium dotatate or high dose of octatide LAR, which is 60 milligrams. The recently presented results showed that the median progression-free survival for octatide LAR was 8.4 months, while the median progression-free survival for lutetium dotatate was not yet reached, estimated at 40 months. This amounts to a 79% reduction in disease progression. Moving on to funding for PRRT. Funding has been available for many different cancer treatments through the Cancer Drugs Fund to allow quick access for patients to beneficial treatments. However, recently, many, ca many cancer treatments, including PRRT, has been taken off the Cancer Drugs Fund. The decision for PRRT has been appealed based on the results of the NETA-1 trial, which was not available prior to this decision being made. If, however, this is unsuccessful, funding will need to be obtained through the clinical commissioning groups, often called CCGs. In other developments, I recently attended a National Institute for Clinical Excellence, also called NICE, scoping meeting for lutetium dotatate in October this year, and lutetium dotatate is undergoing a single technology NICE appraisal. Based on the NETA-1 results, NICE approval is likely to be granted in mid-2016. Lastly, a new development in targeted therapy is now making its way to multicenter clinical trials. Lutetium-labeled somatostatin antagonists have showed promising results in preclinical and early clinical studies. The antagonists bind to more somatostatin receptors without becoming internalized, have higher tumor uptake and longer tumor retention time compared to somatostatin analogs. These advantages may translate to better patient outcomes. We will soon be involved in a phase one, phase two clinical study looking at this compound, looking at the tolerability and safety of it. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Tim Meyer. I'm a professor of experimental cancer medicine at University College London and consultant in medical oncology um, here at the Royal Free Hospital. I specialize in the management of neuroendocrine tumors, and over the past few years, there have been significant advances in the management of these patients. We now have more therapeutic options, and this has um, arisen from a greater understanding of the molecular hallmarks of cancer. One of those hallmarks is angiogenesis, which is the ability of tumors to elaborate their own blood supply. 
Sunitinib has been developed to inhibit angiogenesis and has been trialled in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumours where it has been shown to significantly prolong um, the progression-free survival and also induce responses in around 10% of patients. A second hallmark that has been targeted in neuroendocrine tumours is the ability to sustain uh, proliferation. This can happen through uh, uh, the mTOR pathway, uh, which is inhibited by the drug Everlimus. Everlimus has been evaluated in a number of clinical trials in neuroendocrine tumours, including pancreatic neuroendocrine tumours, where it prolongs progression-free survival and induces responses in around 5% of patients. More recently, at an international conference, the Radiant 4 trial has been presented, and this again has shown that Everlimus um, can prolong progression-free survival and induce responses, although only in around 2% of patients. So over the past few years, we have seen, seen significant improvements in the management of patients with neuroendocrine tumours, but we have a long way to go, and we will only make improvements over the next few years with a better understanding of the molecular mechanisms driving this type of cancer. Um, there have been a number of advances made in other tumours, um, including uh, the use of immunotherapy, and we've yet to understand whether immunotherapy can bring improvements to neuroendocrine patients as it has to other cancers. Thank you very much for your attention. So you've just heard about exciting advances for our patients with uh, neuroendocrine tumours. At the Royal Free Hospital and across University College London, we have a really significant research programme looking into the molecular biology and genes which are affecting these tumours. And by understanding these tumours better, we're able to diagnose patients hopefully at a much earlier stage and also develop new treatments. These are significant times for us and the, the future is really bright for patients with neuroendocrine tumours as these advances, I would hope, should be in place over the next five to ten years which will improve not only patient care but also the quality of life of our patients as well. Thank you.